glow again. Che Axum here, from the Center for from the Center for the Direct of Urban Agriculture and Guardian Education at the University of the District of Columbia. So today we're going to talk about building soils, building the future. Soils are very important. And to really have an understanding of them and give them what they need, you have to really kind of nurture them. So today we're going to talk about a few things of how to really make soil healthy and what soil needs to make you healthy and the crops healthy. So there, there's a connection between soil and health. Um, it's starting to be talked about more and more these days. And in the past, in the 30s and 40s, it was talked about quite a bit, but we kind of got away from it for a while. In the 60s and 70s and 80s, and even in the 90s, but we're getting back to understanding how important soil is. Uh, soil is very important. Many civilizations uh, have um, risen and fall because of the uh, use of or misuse of their topsoils. We're going to be talking also about building soils for nutrition. I mean, soils need certain nutrients. Crops need certain nutrients, and those nutrients that are in those crops really feed us and make us healthy. So having an understanding of which nutrients the soil needs and plants need, and you'd be surprised. Some of those same nutrients are what we need for optimum health. The thing now we're really worried about, or just concerned about a little, is the agrochemicals and genetically modified organisms that is, you are used in agriculture. This might pretend potentially present some problems maybe in the future of this. We will find out, but you know, it, it's a possibility. And nutrition per acre, uh, you know, yields are very important in agriculture, extremely important. But sometimes it's more important, like how much nutrition am I going to produce per acre? That's also important. And Lastly and leastly, why, why has our food become so deficient in nutrients? There's some reasons for that. So soil health does matter, and it's more at stake than yields. So again, there's some soil chemistry, soil microbiology, and soil physics that you really need to kind of pay attention to and really understand that um, having all those things working together and working correctly in the soil-based growing system is very important. And we'll be talking about some of these things in future programs. So what is soil health? People ask all the time, you know, you, we know what human health is, but what is soil health? Well, these are, there's quite a bit to it, but these are some things that, you know, really pertain to soil health. So, so healthy soils drain and warm up quickly in the springtime. One of the, some of the characteristics of a healthy soil. Uh, healthy soils don't crust after planting. Healthy soils soak up heavy rains with little runoff. A healthy soil will be one that considered will be one that stores moisture for dry spells. Resist erosion and nutrient loss. And healthy soil will produce a high quality, healthy crop. We've talked about double digging in soil prep in some of the other presentations, but just to go over it again. And again, I like the double digging is the biointensive, one of the key things in the biointensive method, but it creates a very healthy living environment for the plants and where the plants can really scavenge and look for and find the nutrients that they need. Because sometimes if plants have a limited root space or they have a hard pan where the roots only go three or four inches and stop growing because it's a hard pan created there, if they can go much further and in loose soil, they don't have to compete with nutrients from the plant next to them. And also they can really get the nutrients that are needed if they're in the soil. When I first tried this many years ago, 
I kind of thought it would be a lot of work to do this. And the first couple of times I did it, it was a lot of work because I was doing it incorrectly. I was pushing too hard, digging, not moving the shovel correctly. But as I was shown by the uh, person who kind of wrote the book about this, creating some Zen movement when you're doing this, when you're digging, using your body weight to push the spade or fork in the ground and things like that, not bending over too much, twisting and turning and letting the soil just fall off your shovel when you're doing it, makes it a lot easier than you're trying to do it exert too much physical uh, exertion to really kind of get this done. At the farm, when you're doing this on a large scale, lay, uh, large scale, we don't really do too much double digging. So we have to prepare the soil in different ways by sometimes using machines and things like that. So there's a lot of testing that involved the soil, doing soil samples, balancing and preparation for the soil. One of the things you really want to look at in, in creating a healthy soil is the, the, the soil food lab. These important kind of elements, You're using compost, microarthropods, bacteria, and all these things which help to create and make nutrients available for plant growth. For example, the mycorrhizae is a fungal element in the soil which enhances element take up, especially phosphorus, in the soil. The plant has roots and these mycorrhizae are act as a beneficial attachment to the roots and they enhance the uptake of phosphorus and some of the nutrients in the soil by the plant because of this very beneficial fungi. So there are many things in the soil too that you really need to analyze. Um, Antinomycetes, which are very important elements of organisms in the soil, soil algae, soil bacteria, and all these combine to make up the soil food web, and all these things are extremely important in creating a healthy soil. And there are ways to really kind of look at some of these things under the microscope, even though they're in the soil. You can't see them with the naked eye, but you can see them with the microscope. So why use these uh, natural amendments and compost and things like that? Wouldn't it be easier just to get some chemical fertilizer and throw it out there, some 10, 10, 10 fertilizer or something like that? Well, uh, a lot of people do. A lot of crops are grown that way. But the beneficial health of the soil that the um, some amendments, certain natural amendments and organic amendments provide you create a healthier environment and I believe healthier plants. So there are things to look at. Uh, most fertilizers, are, the three main contents of fertilizers are nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, NPK. Then there are micronutrients and trace elements were very important. And you have to look at the pH is very important in the soil because certain elements and certain nutrients are not uptaken at the wrong pH. Organic matter is very important. <clears throat> CEC, which is calcium exchange capacity or cation exchange capacity. The amount of cations are positive charged elements in the soil, and these are the ones that really move back and forth between the soil and the plant in the basis. And EC, of course, electroconductivity are very important. All these elements produce healthy crops and healthy soil if you get them correct. Which fertilizer do you use? Well, there are many organic fertilizers out there. Um, there are many good nitrogen organic fertilizers. So just do your research and you'll find some really nice ones out there. Uh, this is one I've used in the past, which is good. But there are many others too. But just do your homework and you can find out which ones work best for you and your, your situation and your location. Other nitrogen sources. Well, of course, compost might have a little nitrogen in it depending on the feed that you create the compost with. And also, if you did not let 
water or rain and things like that leach all the nutrients out of your compost, you can create some very good compost if you do it correctly. Fish meal is a, something that I use quite a bit. Then there's uh, organic cotton seed meal. These can be bought online or different fertilizer warehouses. Uh, also organic alfalfa meal. These are very easy on the environment. They don't leach out of the soil too quickly as opposed to using some of the other commercial fertilizers. These tend to need to be mineralized and by the uh, bacteria in the soil and then they become available to the plant. <clears throat> They have a slow release component to it. Calcium, a major, major, major important actor in soil. Calcium would be the the ringleader of the gang. It would be the it would be the one that all the other elements kind of need to get inside the plant. It's the one that's the gatekeeper. And there are many ways to get different calcium. Uh, in your soil, but you have to do the pH test first to see if um, you know if your soil really needs calcium. So there are many types of lime when you for calcium. Uh, there's dolomitic lime, calcitic lime, hydrated or slate, slaked lime, and gypsum. All of these have lime as their major component, and they all do a little few different things as far as acting in the soil. So do your homework to find out how these particular ones act because depending on your conditions and your soil condition and what you need, you would use one of these or the other. All of these are not created equal, but they all do have calcium in them. Potassium sources. Potassium is a main element that is needed to produce good, good root crops. Beets, carrots, turnips, rutabagas, all those root crops like that really require a good source of, calcium, of potassium. So here's some types of potassium uh, elements or amendments that you can use. There's green sand, and also there's kelp meal, which are good sources of potassium. And again, slow release, natural resources for potassium, which don't leach out into the uh, water table and into our streams and rivers. So the next question is organic versus synthetic uh, fertilizer. So uh, in the a lot of fertilizers uh, are, are byproducts of fossil fuels. So they mine fossil fuels or get fossil fuels and they turn that into fertilizer. But then there's a whole legion of uh, organic fertilizers that you can be used. Uh, I like this company, the uh, Portrell Company in Pennsylvania. We use a lot of their fertilizers here at the farm. And they have some very good natural fertilizers which protect the soil, protect the microorganisms of the soil and also protect the, and overall the, the soil food web. We buy these in large quantities at the farm because we need them in large quantities, but you can um, best way to do it is to find some of your friends who are other gardeners and you guys put in to buy bags of these and store them in a dry place and you'll be very happy with the results that you get from your uh, garden. Trace elements are very, very important and they are called trace elements for a reason because you need a very, very, very minute amount of it in your soils. So the soil test that you do will tell you, uh, sometimes if you ask them, uh, for a, a active audit of your uh, trace elements in your soil. One good way to get trace elements in the soil is to use uh, uh, agricultural amendments that come from the sea. Because there are a lot of 
uh, trace elements and things like seaweed and kelp and things like that. So all of these uh, trace elements are extremely important. And um, we will probably have a workshop later on which will show you some of these deficiencies and how you can recognize these in your plants. But these trace elements are very important even though they are only needed in a very small amount. Without them, you get a very inferior crop. Soil test. Well, we do soil tests here at the university. I advise everybody to use a soil test. There's, there's no need to guess when you have the science that can provide you with the information that you need. And soil tests are easy to do. It's easy to take a soil test. Easy to just put it in the bag and send it to the university or off to the lab. And uh, there are many different types of soil tests. And what I would do sometimes in the past when I would farm and I would send soil tests to different places just to sort of get an overall view of you know what's really going on. And you don't need any elaborate instruments to take a soil, even though we do have some soil core probes that we use, if just a trial, you go down about six to eight inches, take a slice of soil out, put it in the bag, move to another location, if it's close by in your garden bed, move to another bed and put it in the bag and mix it together to have a, a, uh, a sample, a random sample, and uh, send it to the lab. soil test that I really prefer is the melanin soil test because soil tests tell you different things but when some soil tests tell you what is truly plant available you can take a soil test but sometimes the nutrients in the soil might not be plant available and that does you absolutely no good in determining what you need to add to your soil or what you need to get for good plant growth so try to find out a soil testing method which tells you if the nutrients are plant available Besides the university, there's a and Labs, there are many other different soil test people uh, in the nation. And um, if you're familiar with soil tests, learn how to read the soil tests and the results, and uh, you become a better grower, a much better grower. So, doing all that, and if you're good at doing all that, and you get all that right, you can make some people really happy, and you can make some people uh, very happy. Uh, nothing like a smiling chef when you bring in a good crop and you get paid for it. The chefs are happy, they will keep you happy. Even growing food in the community. We all need healthy food and healthy food is a very important thing. Growing healthy food to give to your community and to support the food and nutritional security of the community is a very important thing. So growing a good crop and being a good grower is very important.